don't cross the streams, don't cross the streams. Okay, I'm back. We're going to do some more videos on cantrips because <laughs> I said I would, so therefore I can't be lying. I have to actually tell the truth, right? First, I'm going to watch the ad like the rest of you. No, thank you, I don't need Wix. We'll get rid of that. Make sure the sound is working. <laughs> Now, please tell me if the sound is good or bad, or if there are any problems, and I can sort that out before we get started. So, if you're in the live chat, this is your opportunity to let me know if there are problems. Now, I see, I can hear a reverb. Why can I hear a reverb? Get a reverb again. Uh, if anybody can hear the reverb, let me know because I'm sure I can sound, hear something that should not be there. And yet I have made sure that everything is supposed to be doing what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, he's on time. Yes, Fred, I'm on time. Uh, counting the minutes. Fred, sound is good. Okay, so otherwise a bit of an echo. Yeah, well, tends to be tends to be happening. The echo, I think, is a product of winter, and the air is very cold and very damp, and therefore, I think that's what's going on. Now, also, the magic sock might not be working. <laughs> right. Okay. So we're going to just put that, put that down. See if it helps a little bit. <laughs> uh, um, I, I can't say the magic sock is perfect. <laughs> okay, all right. So I'm going to pop out the sound and the microphones for my my ears. <laughs> uh, so what I wanted to say to those of you who are here is I will put the start time down in the description for those of you who want to sort of get past all of my waffle and my setup because I do realize that's not necessarily the most entertaining aspect of the live stream. Uh, but you can't get access to the live streams unless you have subscribed or hit the bell button on my channel otherwise it just doesn't happen unfortunately. Uh, just one of those things make sure bell button subscribed and notifications turned on. So if you are a patron, it's not a problem. You can get access to those things later on because I put them up on the Patreon page for, for you. Uh, there will be an edited version, but it does not include the questions and answers or Q&A at the end of the live stream, if that's the sort of thing you're interested in. So uh, just bear that in mind. All right, so I don't think I need the um, any plugs anymore. I think we've sorted that out pretty much, and uh, people will let me know, obviously, if there are any issues. Um, there, there might be a bit of a lag. I am a long way away, and I suspect there are a lot of people on the internet nowadays all doing their own thing because they are sort of stuck at home. Yeah, reverb twice, uh, then freed up for the, the same low price. That's right. I don't know why it's reverbing. It's, it's a bit bizarre. I'm... I could have sworn I had that all sorted out, but it didn't seem to sort of solve anything. So I'm hoping that I have um, rectified it as best I can. Okay, now we're going to talk about the bard and cantrips. That's why you're here. So first off, I'm going to use slides and images as I go through my notes. There is bound to be a few people who are going to be a little bit unhappy, I suspect, in terms of my selection. That's always going to be the case. Bear in mind, this is just my two cents. Uh, you don't have to take it uh, as gospel because nothing on YouTube or the internet is in fact gospel. <laughs> um, and I will get back to the chat very, very shortly. Oh, dungeon classes here. Is that Gonzo or is that Mark? Could be one or the other. I'm not too sure which one. Anyway. Lag is gone. Excellent. We just needed to give time for YouTube to get things sorted out. It might in fact be not at my end and taking place at YouTube's end because uh, it looks like studio is working fine. Um, okay, so now that I've managed to offend a few people, it's Mark. Hi, how's it going, Mark? Okay, and uh, we will get on to this. Let's get our uh, starting screen and let's talk about the bard because that's why you're here. So, food, drink. 
get comfortable. Let's talk about the Bard. Hi, welcome to How to d, d My name is Fred Wheeler and today I want to talk about Dungeons and Dragons because I always do, don't I? Uh, the topic for today is the best Bard cantrips in Dungeons and Dragons 5e. And yes, I'm going to say it, this is just my opinion. It's not gospel. As I have said many times before, none of my stuff is gospel. It's just an opinion. Bards start with two cantrips and eventually get a total of four cantrips in the game of Dungeons and Dragons 5e. So with a bard, I would recommend only using one method for selecting cantrips. Because the bard gets so few cantrips, you have to really go with one approach, in my opinion. Some other classes you can have two approaches or a third approach to selection, but I think one approach is the only way with the bard. First off, what would you want to do is you want to select just one damage dealing cantrip and the rest are going to be utility, as the bard gets great utility spells or cantrips. And really doesn't get an awful lot of damage dealing or attack cantrips as it happens. In fact, bards probably get the crappiest attack and damage dealing cantrips in the entire game of Dungeons and Dragons 5e, which frankly, I'm not a fan of bards, but this does annoy me quite a lot. They really get shafted. So don't recommend going with taking more than one damage dealing cantrip because your options are very poor and you have less utility function as you run out of spell slots and what a bard does well is utility spells and even utility cantrips. They get some pretty awesome selections for utility. I would suggest taking the following cantrips in this order of priority. <laughs> Actually, that's only a sort of maybe and probably not, uh, rather than a definite. So what are my selections? The short version. I'd go with Minor Illusion, Vicious Mockery, Mage Hand, Prestidigitation. I can just imagine the comments that people are going to have after saying something like that. In that order, of all things, how could you possibly say that? Well, it is my video. So why do I recommend these cantrips in this order? Well, this is my rationale and I'm going to make it really clear I have videos on the topic that I've done before, so I kind of have spoken to these quite a few times already. So the number one for me is always a minor illusion because it has a wide range of possibilities and applications. Even though it has a wide range of possibilities and applications, it's not necessarily the right cantrip for every player because you actually have to know how to use the spell. If you don't know how to use the spell in the game, it will in fact never get used and you will probably not get very far. So what does this cantrip do? It creates an illusionary sound or an image of an object for one minute. Now that doesn't sound like much, but if you use your imagination you can do quite a bit with it. My next choice, because we have to do some damage at some point, and that is Vicious Mockery. Why am I selecting Vicious Mockery as my second cantrip? Because you need some sort of attack cantrip, even if all of your attacking cantrip choices are absolute crap. <laughs> I can just see people fuming as I say this right now. But frankly, it's not a great cantrip. If you look at all the damage dealing or attacking cantrips, Vicious Mockery is not great. So you get to insult a creature for a d4 dice worth of psychic damage and impose disadvantage on the next attack they make. Which sounds great, there is a time frame around that. One of the bonuses to Vicious Mockery, which is definitely not the damage output, and that is it does impart disadvantage if you are able to pull it off, 
if you're able to pull it off, you can impose disadvantage on somebody else's attack or your enemy's attack. And that's actually quite rare. So that's really the big um, takeaway for Vicious Mockery. It's not really the, you know, two or two and a half points of damage you're going to do uh, at low level. It does scale up. I do. I'm aware of this. Number three on my list is Mage Hand because it's really simple to use and you, you will use it frequent, frequently to solve all sorts of problems. I actually did a video on how to use Mage Hand and you will find that really useful if you are willing to sort of spend say 15 minutes just watching that video. And it goes over lots of different ways you can use it. So what does this spell allow you to do? Well, it allows you to manipulate objects and the environment up to 30 feet away. There are some restrictions with regard to how much weight you can manipulate, but other than that, it's a pretty impressive spell. It's often the first spell or cantrip that people will pick out because it's so easy to use and does not require a huge amount of skill to understand how to apply it to your game. So, a very good cantrip. And yes, you could certainly switch out Minor Illusion and go straight for Mage Hand, which I think will probably be the go-to for a lot of people anyway. Okay, the last choice for me is number four, Prestidigitation. Impossible to say correctly, because it's the magical Swiss Army knife of Dungeons and Dragons. And yet again, there'll be some people who are right into Prestidigitation and will be saying, why is this not the first selection, Fred? Well, frankly, I've always found that Prestidigitation carries a lot of negative feelings from Dungeon Masters and other players where people have really exploited it and used it in a way that really annoyed people at the table. So I never usually go straight for this particular cantrip straight away just because I know there are a lot of negative feelings around it. If you're using the cantrip yourself, obviously it's a bonus, you know, it does lots of really incredible things and we'll go over them very briefly. So what can you do with prestidigitation? Well, you have multiple effects. You can color something, you can flavor something, you can chill, warm something, you can clean or soil something. All really useful. You can light or extinguish a small flame. You can create illusionary effects. That is something like a non-magical trinket. It needs to be quite small or an illusionary image. Now, when I say illusionary image, it's going to be much smaller than something like minor illusion could produce okay so it's much smaller than that and you can solve quite a few problems and amuse people or annoy people with this cantrip so it's not a bad cantrip it's on my top tier list of best cantrips for dungeons and dragons 5e so what are some alternatives if you don't like these and so the alternatives that i think you will find the most useful in your game with regard to a bard and what they can actually select is the first one. And the first one is definitely going to be message because you can whisper a message over a very long distance and that stops monsters being able to snack on your very tasty body. Uh, and of course that's something we want to be able to do. And making noise always generate, generally uh, entices monsters to find you, uh, kill you and then eat you. So we don't want that. Number two on alternatives would be mending for me because it can repair a mundane or magical item. There are restrictions on how effective it can be, but frankly, it's an impressive spell. It always has been. It is a little bit situational in terms of its use, so therefore you need the right situations to arise. All of the other cantrips that I have talked about, you will use far more than mending. But there are so few spells that do what Mending does that I had to put it on the list. Okay, so what are a few of using like more books than just the player's handbook? Because I've only really talked about the player's handbook. If you can use spells from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, and I want you to consider these. That's provided your Dungeon Master or the rules that you're playing with at the table allow you to use that book and these options. So here is my suggestion to you if you're using Xanathar's Guide to Everything. I would go with number one, Thunderclap. 
That's right, thunderclap. Because there's no other damage dealing cantrips to select as a bard. <laughs> I just want to cry. I want to cry for you poor, poor bard players who have to put up with this nonsense. Oh dear, okay, alright. So this thunderclap is a smart choice if you plan to stand in the front line of a fight or a battle and be surrounded by e enemies and foes frequently. Jesus, <laughs> this terrible. Um, no, it really, it's a, it's not a great choice. It's really a shite choice. Okay, it should be called thunder crap, not thunder clap. If, if you can use this particular cantrip effectively without going down, you're doing very well. Because the whole concept behind its use is that you are, you have them right up in your face. And if you're a bard and you've always got them up in your face, either you've built your bard to stand in the front line and actually fight it out up close, that's the only time it would make a lot of sense, and you've got to ensure that none of your allies stand close to you so they're not affected by the sodding thing. So actually, I would say, hmm, yeah, I would definitely say the Bard Cantrips in Xanathar's Guide to Everything are pretty crappy. You will find better cantrips sitting in the player's handbook than you will find in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Which is not normally what I would say with regard to Xanathar's Guide to Everything, but with the Bard, as I said, you get shafted when it comes to damage dealing in the player's handbook, and you get shafted again when they put out another book. <sighs> oh my gosh. But the light at the end of the tunnel is, you get access to some of the absolutely best utility cantrips in the game. They have some of the absolute best. Now, if you found this video helpful and informative, fantastic. I actually have a series of videos on the Bard and how their different features work. I have videos on the different types of cantrips and the benefits to those. I have a video on how to use Mage Hand uh, in your game in a creative way. And I have hundreds of videos for players and Dungeon Masters about pretty much every topic you can possibly imagine. If you really want to check those out, you're welcome to do so. If you want to support the channel, you can do that by checking out my Patreon page. Uh, you can go to the Amazon and uh, Book Depository uh, affiliate links. So I have affiliate links to the Book Depository and Amazon where you can buy stuff and I get a small commission. I have a merchandise shelf underneath all of my videos. Make sure to share, like and subscribe to my channel because subscribing is always good because you actually know when the next video is coming. And hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s. Okay, I'm here. I'm not gone. Um, <laughs> oh dear. Okay. All right. So here's here's the the deal. It's, I am not beating up on the bard. Um, I'm I'm really I'm beating up more on the designers for the bard because I really feel like they got a really good selection of utility cantrips. But when it comes to damage dealing. Vicious Mockery, I've seen it used at my table so many times and I always feel bad for the players because when they roll the damage dice, it's like, it's a four-sided dice, which is not like a real dice really, is it, you know. And who's ever been able to get the four-sided dice to roll anything other than just rubbish? You've got to be super lucky. Um, <laughs> I don't hate uh, hate bards at all. Okay, all right. So I'm going to check, check to see if my eyes are any good. Um, I would like to point out because there's a few people in here who have YouTube channels. Um, Overboard DM. So we've got uh, Tom here, Sam Tom Miller. Hello. Uh, uh, is that uh, Sly Variant is here? Hello. I'll just see if my eyes are any better with these on. We'll see how we go. Um, now I'm going to work my way through the chat as fast as I can because today I would like to talk about prestidigitation and how you can use it in your game and some of the problems that I see with the cantrip and its application. 
still a great uh, uh, cantrip, but there are sort of some things that create issues for me. That's why it tends to wind up being further down the, the list. Um, and uh, yes, I am not beating up on the bard. Hi Matt, how's it going? Um, so Overboard DM, that's Joe. Joe runs a channel on miniatures and terrain, and I, I, he does stuff that nobody else does. So I would recommend going and checking out his stuff. Hi Fred, how's it going Fred Hubber? Yeah, I'm, I'm usually on time. Actually, I think I was like one minute late today. If you, if you go by the clock on my uh, computer, I was one minute late. I was in the middle of deciding whether I should add in a new slide and then deciding that was a bad idea because I figured that OBS would start early and I would sort of just get all uh, flustered by that. Um, just joking, I mean, uh, if you count a minute late on, on time, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm glad the sound is good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that the a bit of an echo and there's some sort of feedback from something. Yeah, so I have a computer, and the computer makes a lot of noise, and I can't cut that out. It's a live stream. Um, long lag, yeah, maybe there's just so many people on on uh, on the internet. I would imagine there's a lot of people who are using the internet quite frequently right now. It's school holidays here in New Zealand, so in my area I imagine every single little kid in Helensville is playing Xbox and uh, PlayStation right now, or on the computer, uh, or a variety of other things, watching Netflix or whatever. Um, we do have fibre out here, so I'm sure people are taking advantage of it if they can afford it. Uh, a bit like I'm talking into a tin. Yeah, Papa um, Whiskey, it can be, and I think I was trying to, like I said, I was trying to talk to my brother about it because he knows a bit more about this sort of stuff, and I noticed that it was a, a significant shift. I thought I had everything laid out right, and I think there's been some updates to the software that's created problems for me, and I think also too, because um, the layout in the room has not changed at all, I think it's the, the cold weather is actually affecting the microphone uh, and, that, and that moisture content because there's a lot of moisture uh, around me right now and that won't go until we get to summer and that's like uh, at the end of the year <laughs> so it's a long way off December uh, Pink Line Gaming I don't have all day, yes I know Pink Line Gaming you don't have all day uh, I don't have all day either, but uh, I have to get things right the first time around. It's the nature of live streaming. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer to get things sorted out. Normally I can get everything sorted out within about one and a half to two minutes, uh, and then we're into it. But uh, it's not always going to work that way. Uh, five to four, five to four, not two, five, five by four. I don't know what five by four means, but something like that. So um, for those of you who don't know Dungeon Class, Mark is here. Now Mark runs a YouTube channel that talks about Dungeons and Dragons. A lot of advice, I think mostly for Dungeon Masters, but also for players. And recently I did a video with them talking about uh, how to get cheap miniatures for Dungeons and Dragons. And I would recommend, so this is a much more up-to-date uh, discussion about how to do that. And it's a bit global. It's not just about North America and Canada. So I give, uh, there's a lot of advice that talks about how to do that no matter where you are in the world. There are, of course, going to be limitations. Some people are in places around the world and there's nothing we can do for them because of uh, all sorts of different reasons. But you should definitely go and check out Dungeon Class and that video, okay? Uh, Zcam, what do you got here? Eight second delay on echo. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Approximately five second delay on hearing your voice repeat very faintly. Interesting. Yeah, it's definitely got to be something to do with the, the microphone being affected by moisture, I'm sure of it. Okay, so I just need a drink of water. Uh, we need to get to the bottom of this chat fairly quickly, though. Um, okay, use all notifications. The personalized um, does not uh, work right. Okay, thank you, Fred, because I remember we had discussions around that. Okay, um, Roy Rogers says uh, sound and video is all good. That's good. And no lag here for Dungeon Class. It must be just a, a product of YouTube and who, whoever's getting the, uh, you know, the feedback must be a product of something else. And uh, Matt can't hear the echo. Well, that's good too. Yes, yes, Mark, let's do it live. Um, 
So I'm going to I'm going to put Mark in a really odd space uh, and position right now. I'm not trying to be any, uh, a bad boy. Would people like to see Dungeon Class and me in a live stream at some point? To get it done, I suspect that you would have to have a lot of people say yes and for Mark and Gonzo to agree. Because um, I would. Yeah, I think we've actually talked about it a little bit. But, you know, it's always good to know. Um, do it on their channel rather than my channel or do it on their channel and my channel. Maybe at different times or something like that. Let me know what you think, guys. Okay. Uh... All right, so done that, done that, done that, done that. Let's uh, lag on, slight variant. Anyone knows the best cantrip is true strike? Yes, that's right. <laughs> yes, the best cantrip is true strike. It's it's always true. It must be true because it's got the word true in it. <laughs> uh, King of the ones. I'm offended. Okay, I've managed to offend somebody. Nobody's gone and done a thumbs down. I I I, I thought I would get more thumbs downs. Honestly, I did. Uh, I'm not taking anybody to church. I'm trying not to. Okay. Uh, dear. Okay, what have we got here? Fred says it's going good enough for me. Um, <laughs> fair enough. Yes. No, bards don't deserve the worst cantrips. They don't deserve it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, vicious mockery. I, it's just... You've got to have some sort of damage dealing cantrip, but frankly, it... It does bum me out that it's that it is what it is. Better to use a crossbow. It does unfortunately feel like that. If you want to do damage, that certainly seems to be the case. Um, so I'm not going to dispute that. Okay, you mark if you've, you've got you've got me there. <laughs> uh, when the players have bards, the DM uses creatures with high wisdom. Exactly, and it's like every creature has a high wisdom, and they can never get <laughs> they never fail to save. Ah, uh, dear. Alright, um, true, but a few are resistant to psychic. Uh, that's true, there are very few, but there are cantrips like that do force damage. And force damage, m almost no monster has resistance to force damage. Do you know? So, uh, I, I just don't feel like it's, it's, a, it, it's worth worrying too much about. You could just use uh, a crossbow and you'd probably still do more damage even if they had resistance to it. So, I mean, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't change that fact, unfortunately. Um, but I know what you're getting at. Okay, um, right, so let's keep flicking down here because we need to talk about can uh, prestidigitation and I'm going to take far too long. You're telling Gonzo? Okay. No, no, don't tell Gonzo. Gonzo probably loves some um, bards. Um, as a music teacher DM, I often think about how to combine instruments with uh, weapons, blowgun, flute, uh, shield drum, shield harp. Uh, okay, well that's interesting. I hadn't really thought of that. Most of them are nonsense, so I love them. <laughs> Hi John, how's it going? Take one level of Warlock to get to Eldritch Blast. Yeah, but they... The solution can't be to go and take another class to fix the bard. If you're on, because remember what happens if you don't multi-class in your game. If that's not an option, you can say, "Oh well, I just won't play in that game." But yeah, I don't feel like that's a, a solution when we talk about what are the best cantrips for a bard. We need to talk about the bard cantrips rather than go to the warlock. Uh, that's just my opinion, and frankly. Um, you know, a Warlock's uh, Eldritch Blast really only comes into its own when you start picking up a few more levels. And yes, for those who are wondering, am I going to do a video on the best cantrips for the Warlock? That will eventually happen. Like I said, I would. Um, Preston Richards. Howdy, how's it going? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. You're right. I, if to play without the DM, I would love to play a bard and just bring my uh, mandalore. <laughs> really? Uh, they're horrible songs. Okay, unfold. Okay, let's. Uh, that sounds. That sounds terrifying. Thank you. I uh, I wear this hat quite a lot. It keeps my head warmer than uh, the other options, which is no hat. Okay. Uh, are we getting there? 
a bunch of I'm working through this very quickly. If I if I miss somebody, I do apologise. Hi, Emily. How's it going? It's not summer everywhere right now. That's right. Uh, it's not summer everywhere. Sometimes it's uh, summer somewhere else. <laughs> uh, we called the. <laughs> oh God, what? <laughs> uh, dear, there's a ton of information. Um, watching from Austria. Okay, King of uh, Didi. I'm uh, King. I'm just going to call you King. I forgot the second part wrong. I do apologize. Love your videos. Keep up the good work. Uh, your equipment expertise is astounding. Uh, yes, I am actually struggling with the Dungeons and Dragons adventuring gear videos simply because there is not very much information out there and they take a long time to actually put together. Oh uh, yeah, definitely game. So, Mark is definitely game. I'm definitely game. I would love to know if the people who are watching me are definitely game. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so uh, Matt Nerdy. What do you got here, Matt? Um, guys, make a great team. Please do a live stream. Okay, so we've got one for a live stream. Cantrip should be called the <laughs> true, true height. Yes, absolutely. Uh, what do you got here, Ken? Can you use True Strike to uh, have advantage for your uh, Skyrite spell copied from a, an illusionary script? Oh my god. Oh my god. Let's not go there. And <laughs> be a human and get Spell Sniper for Warlock at level 1. We're not talking about the Warlock today, are we? Are we walk talking about the Warlock already? I mean, I feel like when we do the Warlock video, it's going to go... It's going to go interest. Well, yeah, we'll, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to say anymore. A general nerd, Joe. Hi, happy to be watching the stream. RPG wise, I love uh, mocking words. So on the RP side, I, I do not dispute that vicious mockery in terms of RP and the and the, uh, the ability to sort of use some sort of horrible insult on your enemies is one of the big draw factors for vicious mockery. But frankly, you could do that with any cantrip if you wanted to, because you can say anything as long as it's roughly going to take, say, six seconds. Most dungeon masters say about six seconds, whatever you can fit in that space of time. So it doesn't have to be vicious mockery to do that. Do you know what I mean? But I do understand where you're coming from. Uh, Z Cam, what's the best use of the of an instrument you have seen used for a bard? Um, off off the top of my head, I would not be able to remember. Right now, I'm just trying to get to the bottom of the chat as fast as I can, so we can talk about prestidigitation. Um, so I'm not going to be able to help you right now, unfortunately. Uh, Emily, you could technically technically use arcane secrets if that's what you, it's called. Uh, for other cantrips, right? Yeah, so there is that feature, but here's the thing. You don't get that straight away, <laughs> okay? So it's it's definitely there. Magical secrets, I mean, we'll look it up very quickly. And I, know, I knew that was going to come up. I knew somebody was going to mention that, but that doesn't change the fact that uh, you still get shafted when it comes, comes to damage dealing cantrips. And... And, and frankly, a lot of the other cantrips that I talked about, sort of beyond having four, is, it's often it's not really worth it. Do you know what I mean? It's not really worth it. So, where is it? Magical Secrets. So you get this by level 10. <laughs> level 10. Really? Um, okay, I can't do that with these glasses on. You can, you have plundered magical knowledge from a wide spectrum of disciplines. Choose two spells from any class, including this one. Okay, a spell you choose must be of a level you can cast as shown on the bard table or a cantrip. Okay, the chosen spells count as a bard spell for you and are included in the number in the spells known column of the, uh, the bard table. You learn two additional spells from any class at level 14 and again at level 18. So this is high level play we're talking about. Here's the problem with magical secrets. If you can get any two spells from another class, why the heck would you pick a cantrip? And if you do pick a cantrip, what sort of cantrip do you select? 
Now I know somebody's going to say Eldritch Blast, but no, actually if you want to do more damage and it be able to have a bit of range, I would actually go with um, Toll the Dead, simply because if you target the right uh, enemy, you get a D12 worth of damage. Makes far more sense, frankly. Even something as um, appallingly hard to use as Poison Spray does more damage. And of course there are things like if you want to really pick up a utility um, cantrip and insist on using it for, for cantrips, then why not take Guidance? Because Guidance, frankly, if it was available to more classes, it would be one of the best cantrips to pick. So Magical Secrets being used for selecting cantrips, mm, I'm very iffy on that one. Um, and even if you were to do so, yeah. So yes, you could do it. All right, let's let's we we're not going to get to the bottom of this chat. Are we ever going to talk about um, prestidigitation? Okay, if it gets to 140, I'm stopping looking through the chat and we're just talking about it because we need to do this. Yeah, don't need to worry about it, Emily. Magical secrets. Um, Preston, uh, not not Preston. Sorry, Preston. Hi, Preston Richards. Been enjoying your Curse of Strad videos recently. Preston. I am hoping to do more videos on the Curse of Strahd. I really am. I am I've just hit, hit a mental block. I don't know how to get past it. It happens to us sometimes uh, as YouTubers we sort of get stuck and I don't know how to unstick myself. I'm hoping that uh, I'm hoping actually that Gonzo will help me get past that because I know he's run the Curse of Strahd mostly. <clears throat> I'm also hoping that uh, Matthew Perkins, when I get time, I could have a chat with him because he runs a YouTube channel as well. Not Chris Perkins, Matthew Perkins. Um, right, uh, Zcam, definitely a word like you see in a DNA class together. Right, okay, Zcam likes the idea as well. Best use of instrument by a bard was my barbarian who turned his horn by beating... What? Turned his horn turned his horn by beating the critic on the head with it. Okay. All right, use it as a blunt instrument. <laughs> no, it's not. Vicious Mockery isn't really about damage. It's meant to keep you alive at low levels. No, well, see, I, I frankly have never seen that to be the, been the case. Um, it is actually easier to find ways of getting advantage to increase your chance of hitting um, high AC uh, rather than applying disadvantage to them. I mean there are very few things that do apply disadvantage so that's really the only selling point for me with regard to Vicious Mockery. But it's a saving throw and if you have to go for a saving throw over an attack roll, an attack roll tends to be always better in terms of your chance to be successful. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. I, Sam, I'm trying to figure out what you've written there, but um, I can't figure it out. Yes, Fred is always hysterical. Toll the Dead is... No, it's not. That's the, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the bugger, is it's not. it's not. It's not on their list. They have a very short list when it comes to um, cantrips. It's very, very short. <laughs> Uh, okay, all right, I got to the end. I know there are people who want to talk about Vicious Mockery to the ends of Earth, but I am taking that away. I am grabbing the player's handbook. I am grabbing a pen. I've already got it lined up, and we're going to talk about, because I can't do it with my eyes, uh, with these glasses on. It's not really designed for reading. Um, and we're going to talk about Prestidigitation, which is in the player's handbook, on page 267. So, it's got a casting time of one action, okay, which is great. Its range is only 10 feet, so it's very, very short. It's got a verbal component, which means you have to speak something, and a somatic a component, so there's a gesture. No material component. And a duration usually is up to one hour. There are some exceptions based on the sort of options that are here. I'm hoping people will help me with this as I, as I work through because at some point I will get there um, and we will do a video specifically on prestidigitation. So the first thing on here is you can um, 
instantly create a harmless sensory effect. So the examples they give is a shower of sparks, a puff of wind, a faint musical note, or an odd odour. So really, really simple stuff. It's not complicated stuff, right? But how is that beneficial to you in your game? Now we think about those sorts of things. Really what we're talking about is very basic magical tricks. So how is that useful? I think that's more useful as a way of demonstrating to somebody that you can do sort of like a magical trick as a performance or to entertain somebody. So there's an opportunity to entertain or create a performance. So that might actually be useful at a role play level or it might actually be useful in terms of negotiation, uh, persuasion. I don't know that it necessarily will be hugely useful in terms of intimidation because the effects are quite simple unless you're dealing with somebody who's really, really superstitious and uh, any sign of magic is sort of beyond their um, comprehension. So magic tricks and uh, and that, that's what I'm going to list it down as. It's basically magical tricks. So we're talking about intimidation. Yes, maybe a little bit of that. But I think, frankly, it's going to be more around negotiation. Negoti negotiation. I'm having problems spelling right now for some reason. And uh, performance. Some sort of performance. And then persuasion. Now, I haven't got into any huge specifics around that, I do realise, um, but what I did want to say is that uh, it's such a wide range or spectrum that you could apply it to that, uh, frankly, it'd be impossible for me to do a video or talk about it in a, in a way that um, would make sense. I can probably pull out examples at some point, but those are the, the sort of the four things that I thought of. Um, how useful is creating a sensory effect going to be in terms of deception? I'm still not too sure how well that would work, and I, I would need to have examples that somebody has has used in their game. And I find that when it comes to this particular um, cantrip, a lot of people get sort of stuck because there's so many different ways you can use it and so many different groups have used it in different ways it can be very complicated all right so i believe uh king is mentioned something here um this is the perfect spell for a a short or long rest in in a dungeon uh, create a puff or of wind to undust the part of the room you're in collect some wood and create a small campfire now so King's made the, this is the second element of this cantrip, right? Which it says you instantly light or snuff out a candle or a torch or a small campfire. So let's talk about the fact that how are we going to be using that? So to light and snuff out. So a campfire makes perfect sense. But what else can we use other than a cantrip or a spell to create a campfire or light a candle or to light a torch? We can use flint and steel and or our tinderbox, which is really just a, got those things in it, plus maybe a few other things, um, the tinderbox. But flint and steel. That's the easiest way to do it, right? You don't necessarily have to be using prestidigitation to make that happen. It does have some utility to it. Now, I know a lot of people will say, well, hang on Fred, you can, if there's a light source and you're dealing with a monster or enemies that can't see in the dark, then you can snuff out the light source uh, in the, uh, before the battle or during the battle, but probably before the battle, to give yourself you know, cover from the darkness. And if everybody is sees in the dark, they can see what they're doing and the creatures that don't see in the dark can't see nothing, which is like a huge benefit. So here's the problem doing it before combat with snuffing out a light to use it as an, a, an advantage in that way. And that is, it, it's verbal. You have to say something. So the only way to not be noticed when you speak out the words for that particular spell, and it's got a verbal component, to light something or to snuff out that light. And that is 
so whisper it. Here's my problem with whispering a spell. You're falling into dungeon master discretion. Not all dungeon masters will allow something like that. So I don't think that's going to be hugely useful. Now what about if you were to do it in combat? I don't think then you need to worry about the whispering side of things. Okay, Whispering the words to the spell really won't make too much of an issue. So there is an advantage to knocking out the lights so that you get advantage. But you know, so many monsters and so many classes, um, races in Dungeons and Dragons see in the dark. Now you don't need to have perfect vision, but it sort of overwrites you know, the advantage of there being darkness in the first place. Short of having to make perception checks, and in a fight you're usually not doing that. Do you know what I mean? There's no significant um, disadvantage for somebody who has um, a dark vision fighting in darkness, unless it's magical darkness, which is a different kettle of fish altogether. Okay, so snuff out light. So light and light, snuff out light. So we got a uh, light campfire. Uh, campfire and then we've got the as I said we've got the um, uh, knock out the lights in a battle okay lights and battle god 13 minutes is never going to be anywhere near enough time to deal with a spell like this but anyway we'll do our best okay um, King is also what do you got here clean your group's clothes flavor their stale food, warm their bed rolls, have a faint tavern music playing uh, to lighten the mood, create a sensory effect of uh, rose fragrance uh, and cast, yeah, so these are certainly things you can do, but how useful are they? In terms of solving a problem, um, because the sorts of things that prestidigitation do are for me, they're like, you're doing something that makes your life easier at the mundane level, rather than necessarily solving problems that deal with exploring a dungeon or a tomb or some ruins or a castle or something like that. I'm not disputing what you're saying, King, because you're absolutely right. Those things can be done. But it's just how useful are they? So let's look at the first thing that you talked about there, and that's because you're working your way through that list quite nicely. So let's look at the next one, and that is um, cleaning something. Cleaning something up. Now, why would you want to clean something up? One, if you're going to a dinner party and you need to look good, fine. So uh, clean clothes. So going to a dinner party. Why else might you want to clean yourself? Maybe you've got something on you that smells really bad and it has a pretty significant disadvantage for you. So that, that might be a reason. So, um, uh, dangerous smell. So dangerous smell removed. Particularly if it's going to affect you and you have to make a constitution saving throw. Um, um, right, I'll put ball here. Uh, right, so that's the cleaning side of things. I, I can't really think of anything else that necessarily is going to be super useful in terms of cleaning. I've heard people say there are really good uses for soiling stuff, but I think that still, I feel like that really does require dungeon master play in. So when you say soil, you know, I think one of the things I've heard in the past is you have like urine appear on uh, a guard's crotch so that they feel embarrassed and have to go and clean themselves and then of course they'll leave their post and you can get past and then you, of course you, you've, you've gotten around to them but you know even a guard if they've spell on them is going to stay put and make sure you're gone and lock the gate okay if, particularly if the gates are open they'll lock the gate then they'll leave their post because leaving your post as a guard usually results in court-martial and uh, consequences and a lot of consequences for a fantasy world in medieval time would have been execution uh, or a lo long prison um, spell uh, lashes of the whip none of which are really particularly pleasant so I think that's not necessarily going to work quite the way we would hope with regard to soiling uh, a guard's crotch. Okay, so soil, 
something. Soil clothes. You can soil other things. I'm sure somebody's going to come up with a, an idea that I hadn't thought of. Um, soil. Um, guard. Uh, crotch. Eh, it's not very practical. Not really. But we'll put it down anyway. Okay. Um, now. Next on here we have... I think you said something about warming bed rolls. I, I will write down warming bed rolls because we do have a warming section here, chilling and warming. And I mean, of course, yes, you can chill somebody's drink, but how useful is that other than being convenient? Do you know what I mean? Um, so warm bed rolls, warm bed rolls. Just convenient, but not like super, super useful. And uh, now here's here's where people talk about flavoring food. How big an effect is flavoring something going to um, have? I think one of the biggest benefits to flavoring something might be to flavor wine that isn't very good to taste better, and then try to sell it to somebody. Does that make sense? Because if you can, you can do like one cubic foot, which is quite a lot, and it's going to last an hour, you can flavor that bottle of wine and then try and sell it to somebody or pass it off as, as a token, particularly if you've only got water. All you need to do is put water, which is cheap as. Um, but do you get drunk by flavored um, water that tastes like alcohol if it's had prestidigitation cast on it. So there's a question for you right there. Is like, so will that actually work in that way? I'm not sure that it necessarily will. Chill a drink. Uh, seven, what else have we got here? I said flavor, so flavor wine. I can see a, a way of using that um, in, in the game. I can, I can honestly, I can see that could be quite useful. Flavor wine. Wine or uh, water, water to wine, or something else. Uh, if you are stuck and the only thing you can eat is things like um, branches and leaves and bark, then maybe flavoring them so they taste a bit better would make a lot of sense. Convenient, but not is it super useful? I'm, I'm not sure. But Ken, you did provide quite a lot of uh, suggestions, which is great. Okay, so tavern music. So here's the thing. Is there likely to be somebody who can't play music in a tavern? Uh, chances are there'll be somebody who will sing. Yes, you could make uh, uh, like a, a musical melody take place. <sighs> music in tavern. Um, so that's, that's the, the illusionary sound. And it can last up to an hour, so it would last quite a long time if you wanted to do something like that. And it'd still have to be simple; wouldn't have to be wouldn't be complicated in any way. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. So thank you for that, Aaron. Uh, what else? A group symbol on the wall for a hour to bluster the morale. Now I'm not sure I understand what you're saying by that, um, King. You'll have to explain that a bit more. Thanks. Um, I'm. You're certainly providing lots of information, but I don't understand what that's trying to do. You'd have to ex yeah. expand on that. Uh, Aaron, I use it to aid others in intimidating by making the sensory effect look like heat wave uh, coming off, off the intimidation and sparks um, popping off, off of it. Okay, all right, so... So you're talking about what I was talking about before. So something like creating sparks would certainly be intimidating. You know, it, being able to create fire in your hand would could be quite intimidating as well. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. So we've already got that covered, Aaron, but that's that's good. So we'll put down sparks. So what I guess what we need to do, because um, the sensory effects, there are so many different things you could do. What are some things that people have done that aren't actually listed in the player's handbook? Sparks is one that is already sort of suggested. Uh, okay. Uh, what's that, King? Divisions. Not sure what that means. 
All right, uh, and now I need to work down here fairly quickly. The trinkets you can create last till the end of your next round, so it's only 12 seconds, no? Uh, I believe you're right. So you first, first set a second, um, first round is six seconds, and then it's the end of your, now is it here? I'm pretty sure it says it here. Yeah, to the end of your next turn. So that's about 12 seconds. So you can only make a trinket for, for 12 seconds. Not hugely useful. Do you know what I mean? Do you think about how, you, it's not like you can make a coin and give somebody a coin and say, here you go, um, I have something for you. What you could do is if you already have coin shaped objects, you could color them to look like gold. Um, or if you've got just a bunch of stones, you could color them to look like gold because you can color something. Uh, and I think, mate, hopefully, I haven't jumped too far ahead as we talk about this sort of stuff. Um, chill, warm flavor. And there's a color section here as well. Yes, color is underneath. So let's mark that down. Uh, and that is, you can color rocks to look like gold nuggets. I've had players do this. The benefit is, it lasts up to an hour. Only problem is, close inspection will probably reveal that it's not actually gold. And it's just a rock. Uh, so, yeah, that probably is the only drawback with trying to use it in that way. I need another drink of water. <clears throat> okay, right. Uh, working our way through here. Matt, um, ever used flint and steel in, in the real world? It takes a long time. Wind, rain makes it worse. Um, the spell has the advantage. Yes, yep, if you've got a world where your dungeon master is making it difficult for you to use flint and steel, um, Matt, that would certainly make a lot of sense. I suspect that as a player you'd probably get quite fed up with them. There are ways of um, lighting something when you do have to deal with those sorts of things. Creating cover, um, blocking it from the wind. You know, it's not like people don't have to do, deal with these things as it is. Um, and you're dealing with adventurers who should really be walking around with a flaming torch as it is. You know, if you're going adventuring, you'd have a flaming torch. You use the flaming torch to start your campfire. Uh, and I did a video on how to use a torch not so long ago, as it happens. And as we know uh, from that video, chances are your torch will not go out just because some water falls on it. In fact, it may create a few problems. Uh, give me batteries and steel wool. Much work. <laughs> uh, what do you got here, King? It's a neat campsite upgrade. Uh, a DM's gave, gave us a plus one damage on any f first attack after the rest um, because of that. Okay. All right. I'm still trying to fathom how that... Yeah. Feels very Dungeon Master dependent. Okay. King of the Ones. Use it to make... Second instrument sound to accompany your performance check. Okay, all right. So you can make a second musical instrument noise. So that's um, musical sound. Musical. Oh, for a second there, I'll put magical musical sound of instrument. Um, okay. I mean, frankly, what I've always found with Prestidigitation is a lot of people, what they'll do is they will use it to annoy other players or the Dungeon Master and start turning people's clothes pink uh, and just just humiliate them. Um, not that I'm suggesting you do that, but that tends to be what I find in the games I've played. It's, it's used more as a way of just um, letting off steam. Okay, uh, da, 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 da. King, what do you got here? I made our, our elf small, smell different, because uh, a certain dragon would only focus on elves. Ah, that's interesting. King, I have never heard of that one. So if you've got, so you change the smell of your race. Okay, I'll give you that. 
I, I, I think that makes a lot of sense and there are there have been occasions where there are monsters that can pick up the smell of a particular race that I've seen in pre-made adventures so yeah yeah smell so um, let's put down there uh, change scent scent of a race uh, if a monster, if a monster identifies, identifies a foe, okay, got it, I got that, I like that, that's a good one, I'll put that down, um, attacks based on smell, attacks based on smell, okay, so you're talking about a creature that deals with has the scent ability because there is some monsters that have the ability to use scent to detect you and find out where you are and you know when we are trying to escape or move through an area the idea is you have to be traveling downwind so that you don't wind up with the creature picking up your scent right but if you can remove all scent from some something then you've got no scent to pick up so actually that makes a lot of sense let's put that down so remove scent to pass a, um, a creature with good nose. Yep. Let's mark that down. I think that's a good idea, mate. Well done. You've obviously, I think by the sounds of it, King's used prestidigitation quite a lot. <laughs> and, uh, and more great ideas yes yes King's definitely obviously used it quite a lot um, sound of a passing um, passing passing gas followed by by the stench okay because you can look <clears throat> it does actually state that you can use it multiple times and have multiple things happening here's the problem to do this and to pass it off as a deception or intimidate somebody you might find you need to get rid of the the verbal and the somatic or the, you know the, the speaking side of it and the gestures so that it doesn't look like you are just casting a spell rather than there is some sort of legitimate issue so I, I get what we're saying here but there is definitely a an element to we need to eliminate the component components to the spell to be able to be deceptive in that way um, Creating a strong stench, particularly if you're dealing with something that doesn't like smells. Yep, absolutely. Uh, that's 11, that's 12. Uh, strong smell. Smell, fart, and stench. I can't think of too many monsters that are affected by the sense of uh, somebody's fart, though or bad smells. Um, I think uh, all adventurers with regard to monsters are considered a bad smell anyway. <laughs> okay. Alright, so we're running long now so I need to get my ass into gear and we need to get through this much quicker. A puff of wind is really useful a lot of the time, um, sometimes you need the, the DM's discretion. Yeah, look, a lot of this is going to be DM's discretion. A puff of wind, so we'll mark that down as our sensory effect, which I think is already uh, listed here. Puff of wind, so we keep going. Um, but yeah, moving a section of fog or a mist, I really feel like that that is going to be difficult if you've got a lot of fog or a lot of mist. You can only really move so much, it would take quite a long time to shift it. Um, but I'll mark it down as move, shift and f um, move, fog and mist. Three. Move, fog and mist with puff of wind. It's not a very strong puff of wind, that's the thing we need to realize. Okay, warm bed rolls, great for prison escape adventure. 
Okay, so I th yeah, like I said, con convenience, warming bed rolls is just convenience, really. Flavor food and drink after you um, poison it. Ah, okay, so now King makes a really good point here. Being able to flavor something to hide and disguise a poison in it makes a lot of sense. So let's let's put that down. So um, it's a reflavor. Flavor. Uh, drink or food laced with poison. Not that we're going to be doing that a lot. Not that we have our players constantly doing that sort of thing. <laughs> but it's a good it's a good idea. So I, I'm I'm marking it down. Emily, hi Emily, what do you got here? Um, a character in my group likes to make water taste like alcohol to trick our alcoholic friend into drinking less so she's not uh, exhausted in the morning. Ah, okay. We did actually talk about turning uh, water into alcohol as a, a potential use. Um, and I think the benefits are you can use it, you should be able to use it on NPCs and monsters as well. You know, why, why not? It's only a small area. <clears throat> you can do it in multiple bottles if you wanted to. You could do it in three bottles. You can do it three times. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I got it, King. The big smiley face. <laughs> uh dear. All right, what do you got here, King? Um, it's just a neat thing to increase uh, morale in the group. Every group needs a symbol and prestidigitation lets uh, you make one every six seconds. So I use it, um, okay, I use it a lot. Now that symbol lasts for one hour. So you can create a mark or a symbol. Um, so I guess I don't know of too many ways that people have done that, that it, that it has been super useful. What I couldn't can think of in terms of what might be useful is to put that symbol onto another NPC uh, to draw attention to them, uh, particularly if you're dealing with an, a third party who doesn't like them. That that makes a lot of sense. I'm not sh quite sure how that would work, but well, you know, there's time to think about those sorts of things. Uh, King, uh, clear a room by filling room with smell of skunk. <laughs> skunk smells. Yeah, okay. Smell of skunk. Smell of skunk. Clear room. Now, I guess the question is, you can only affect one cubic foot. So that's not a huge area. Do you, do you see what I mean? And if you've got a big room, you only can only affect one little area. Um, whereas a skunk would probably affect like quite a large area. So is that going to necessarily work? And, that, and again, this is why I don't like prestidigitation quite so much, because it's hard to figure out if the dungeon master will let you do it. <clears throat> but it is still the Swiss Army knife of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, okay, what do you got here, King? Maybe use it to bribe a guard and make quick escape. Yep. Yeah, so how are you going to bribe the guard? You create like a, you get a, you have a stone and you make it look like gold and you use that to bribe your guard. So. Yeah, making the, nu the nugget of gold to, to bribe somebody is certainly bribing. I'll write down bribing behind it. And it will last a fair amount of time, which is always good because that's what we want. So we want a good length of time before they find out that we've hoodwinked them. Um, okay, what else? Yeah, 12 seconds is enough to flee. It depends on how fast the creature moves, mate. <laughs> okay. Um, Glon X. Prestidigitation can be used to mark unconscious enemies with a bunch of fake, fake blood in order to accuse them of your crime. Okay. It can be used to mark unconscious enemies with a bunch of fake blood. I'm not sure how that would... How's that supposed to be a, um, useful? Good night, Joe, by the way. Oh, you're probably already gone. How is that supposed to be useful? Putting marks of blood on somebody who's unconscious? 
how how is that supposed to get them to be look as as the, you know because usually if somebody else is unconscious they usually considered the victim and anybody who isn't unconscious is considered potentially a suspect and a perpetrator so I don't understand how that's supposed to work you'll have to explain a bit more king of ones uh, division make a sound to draw oh diversion Make a sound to draw attention away from something someone in your party is doing. So, diversion. Yep, absolutely. So, what sort of sounds would we make? Because remember, we can't make kinds of sound. We can't make anything that's too significant. It would be faint. So, it can only be a faint noise. That might be enough, you know. Um, it might be a single word. Diversion sound of voice um, a creak um, door slam maybe probably we can go go further with that but that's that's not bad that's pretty good okay king I also flavor stones and let them smell like meat it's perfect perfect trap they eat them and afterwards you attack okay um, I'm still not quite sure I understand what's going on there <laughs> good night uh, Glon X pardon me okay uh, we are almost to the end of this or oh, are we oh, I'm just falling behind I have to move faster you can mark parts of the um, of, of the dungeon your group has been in yes so you mark your mark areas to keep track of where you are. Mark dungeon dungeon to keep track track of where you have been. It allows you to get back out so you can follow those marks. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Good good idea. Uh, also be used to freshen up your breath and the like, which is specific situations, could give you benefits of friends without other uh, drawbacks. Okay, all right. So before you um, decide to kiss the, um, the the barkeep or the barmaid, uh, you freshen up your breath. <laughs> okay. Fresh breath. <laughs> oh dear. Before kissing. Bar keep or made. <laughs> okay, good night, Mark. I'll see you later. Um, big beach day tomorrow. Not cold here in Florida. I bet it isn't, Mark. Okay, if there are guards with dogs, make guards smell like meat or like a cat to try to get the dog. To turn on handler. Now here's the problem. The only way to do that is only got a range of 10 feet so you have to be quite close. You've got to speak some words and perform a gesture. That in itself will alert the guards to what you're trying to do. Does that make sense? So there could be a problem with doing something like that. I get what you're trying to say King. Um, okay. So we'll just put down make creature smell like meat or food yeah I don't know that it's hugely practical though because of the restriction of of uh, distance that's that's the big um, drawback uh, okay da -da -da -da. Yes. yes I love wizards too King <laughs> Soiling yourself is like um, like burns to get a social um, advantage could come up up once and twice. <laughs> oh dear, uh, I, I'm I'm trying not to imagine that too much. That's gone and taken me onto a, a trail that I'm not too sure is good for me. <laughs> um, I've given sleight of hand checks to cast spell without looking like you're casting a spell. Depending on the situation, no reason. 
uh, reason verbal can't be whispered. Yeah, well, I talked about whispering stuff before, and where that might be a problem where it's very heavily dependent on the dungeon master. Now, if you're a dungeon master who allows that, that's fine, and of course the players might be able to apply it in that way. But if you're a dungeon master who doesn't allow the sleight of hand to do those sorts of things, to perform the gesture, or to, to whisper those words, then you might have a problem. Um, Uh, if you're playing dead, the smell of decay might help. Ah, okay, man. Okay. Okay, so, so, smell like decay for undead creatures. So, really, you're trying to perform a deception to, pre to present yourself as being like them, really. That's just a form of deception, using smell. Okay, I got it. You still might have to follow that up with a few other things. That might not necessarily be enough. Um, you wouldn't need magic um, to do that, King, uh, da, 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 only to clean it up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, only three symbols, that's right. Uh, Gandalf marked Bilbo's door with a magic symbol. Yes, he did, to help him find, uh, find that door again and to allow somebody else to find that door. So, depending on the... But remember, um, Gandalf and Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit is a, a, a storybook. It's not a Dungeons & Dragons game. So how is that going to be useful in your Dungeons & Dragons game? Okay, Emily, uh, depending on the technology, use it in your campaign. You could use the smell of gas leak and threaten to blow the room up. Uh, Okay, all right, smell of gas. A lot of people want to go with smells of stuff. Are creatures uh, in your world going to understand that the smell of gas uh, even, will they even know what it is? Does it make sense? You know, will they actually understand that there is the smell of gas? Smell of gas, potential fire hazard, and we're talking about a deception here. Okay. Um, okay, I got to the bottom. All right, so that, I'm, I'm impressed. Okay, so, uh, Glon X kills someone you're not supposed to. Someone else comes by, knocks them out. Um, uh, pat them with blood. Oh, okay, paint them with blood and hope. For medieval justice system to do the rest. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, now I understand what you're trying to do with that. Okay, so you so you knock out, knock out an NPC, uh, cover with blood. Now here's the thing: can you actually cover them in blood? Because it allows you to color something. But it doesn't actually allow you to create another substance on somebody. But you can create marks. So I don't think blood is going to work. Um, cover with cuts, maybe. You might be able to do small lines or cuts. Because you really can't create another um, substance with a spell. Um... Deception. Okay, I need another drink of water. Urgency. Uh, gets levitate. Should they include proficiency bonus to spell along with uh, constitution for check? Or is proficiency more class based? Okay, so I don't have the rules for the the urgency. Gency. 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 God. Okay, I'm getting tired. Um, I don't have the rules for that right in front of me. But usually your class specifies what your saving throws are, okay? So if you're talking about applying proficiency to a spell for a constitution check, I'm assuming you're talking about a constitution saving throw, uh, which is probably related to some sort of poison effect. That's usually what's going on there. Uh, that only works... It only works if the class uh, allows you to have proficiency in that particular saving throw. I think that's what you're talking about. 
So yeah, proficiency is more class based. There are occasions, I think they're very rare, that there are benefits to saving throws for some races. But I cannot remember the rules around the in, um, the era Gensai. Uh, also, also just let your enemies feel spiders crawling down their backs and make bee sounds uh, near their ears can change a situation quick. Now, how do you make an enemy feel spiders crawling down their back? Because how is that supposed to work with regard to the um, prestidigitation? I don't see anything there that would allow you to make that happen. It doesn't actually create a sensory um, um, tactile feel. It's a sensory effect. So sparks, puff of wind, a faint music, an odor. Are you saying that you could potentially, since it's a sensory effect, you're looking at touch? That's actually quite interesting. But there's no mention of that here in the spell. Um, but you make a good point. We're going to mark that down. I'll have a think about that. So a faint touch. Touch. Sting. Or bite. Interesting. Have to think about that a lot more. <clears throat> what else? Um, no destruction, indestructible me. You, you, I know you're off topic, but that's all right because you know I deal with off topic stuff anyway. Um, but that's really all I can sort of think of with regard to your question. I meant you can um, trap, um, trap beet by flavoring beast by flavoring some stone and giving them smell like uh, meat, then leave them placed. Okay, all right. Okay, so. All right, so that kind of makes sense. So you can potentially with, I mean, you're probably thinking about a, a stone or a rock, okay? You make it smell like meat, but it also has to kind of look like meat. If it doesn't look like meat, there's a problem, right? So you're probably going to have to put a couple of different effects on the same thing for a creature to be uh, convinced that it's potentially something they can eat. So make... Stone, smell, taste, and uh, look like meat. Now you can probably make it meat coloured, but I don't know that you can do much more than that. Because the illusion itself, without getting too complicated, illusionary image, the, the aspect that says create a non-magical trinket or an illusionary image, and that would we, we would be falling in, uh, can fit into your hand last up to the end of your next turn. So it wouldn't be long, long enough. It wouldn't be very long. So I think you would have to go with smell, taste, and sort of look the right colour. And that's really about it. Uh, and that's sort of to um, deceive a wild animal, animal or beast. Okay. Alright. Um, paint their hands with uh, dried blood, perhaps. Yeah, I think you could make their hands red, but I don't know that you could actually go dried blood. I think that's going to require a lot of dungeon master um, discretion to actually pull that one off. Just thinking in terms of what, what will be most likely to happen. Uh, what else have we got here? Also use true strike in order to paralyze... True strike... How do we get on to True Strike? <laughs> How do we get on to True Strike? Okay, what do you got here, Sam? Uh, Disney has used air bursts from vents to mimic the feel of mice running on your legs uh, for their honey. I shrunk the kid audience attraction. Might do something similar to Spider Rat's effect. Ah, okay. All right, So, and, and the spell could do something like that. But here's the thing. It's got a small range of only 10 feet, so, you know, is it really being affected by your spell or by a, a little creature that's running along you? So there, I think there's the problem that everybody keeps forgetting about, you know, when you try to use prestidigitation to deceive somebody, you have to be so close to cast it, unless you can get rid of those components, I feel like your dungeon master is probably not going to let you do that. Uh, okay, I got that. 
Right, hi Jack, how's it going? Prestidigitation will let you cover up um, bad taste in food, including poisoning. Yeah, no, we talked about that. We've already got that marked down. Uh, yeah. Minor illusion. Um, basically, with minor illusion, I've got a lot more to cover on that. I think we have we've covered as much as we really can with regard to prestidigitation. The biggest issue is, I think, deception, where you're trying to deceive somebody, and uh, that deception is going to be difficult because you have two components, verbal and somatic, and you are so close because you've only got a range of 10 feet. If the range was much longer, you could probably get away with a lot more, but that's, I think, the biggest issue that I see with that particular spell. Anyway, I think we are done for today. We've been here a long time, like an hour and a half almost. So wherever you are in the world, whether it be the morning, the afternoon, the night, or the early morning, make sure to look after yourself, your family, your friends, and look, be nice to your neighbours. And hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s. Oh, and I would like to say thank you to everybody who participated in the live chat and talked about prestidigitation because you gave me a lot of ideas that I hadn't thought of and um, I'm sure at some point there will be a video on it but much more likely you're going to see minor illusion in the future.